because I, you know, I think that this is a very important occasion, and it would be very good to kind of present it to you today, uh, the way I had come to really believe about the relationship and and why the people who who say they support Brother Malcolm and who say they support Dr. King, if we could get together with each other, we would form a very powerful movement in this country. If we could get together and pay attention to what these brothers said. Okay, the first thing is on black on unity. Here's Dr. King. There are already structured forces in the Negro community that can, that can serve as the basis for building a powerful united front. The Negro church, the Negro press, the Negro fraternities and sororities, and Negro professional associations. We must admit that these forces have never given their full resources in the cause of Negro liberation. But the failures of the past must not be an excuse for the inaction uh, of the present and the future. These groups must be mobilized and motivated. Now listen to this sentence. This form of group unity can do infinitely more to liberate the Negro than any action of individuals. We have been oppressed as a group, and we must overcome that oppression as a group. How many people you, you have know that Dr. King said something like that? I mean, how many, how many King supporters you talk about that Dr. King? So then I said, let me go and get a quote on unity, Brother Malcolm. He says here, I wrote here, uh, contrary to, to popular belief, Brother Malcolm's outreach to civil rights leaders began when he was still in the nation of Islam. It is reflected in an excerpt from a July 31st, 1963 letter to Dr. King, uh, to Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote this letter to all eight civil rights leaders at that time, Dr. King being one. And here's what he said, quote, if capitalistic Kennedy and communistic Khrushchev can find something in common on which to form a united front despite their, their uh, tremendous ideological differences, it is a disgrace for Negro leaders not to be able to submerge our quote unquote minor differences in order to seek a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. Now you see the similarity? You see the similarity? You know, now I'm not going to say, folks, and I want to make it very clear, I'm not going to say these two brothers ever would have been like home, home boys. But I truly believe they could have developed a serious working relationship. And obviously, well, by the time we get through, we're going to see that Diego Hoover thought the same thing. These were the two people he feared more than anyone else. I had another quote on unity from Brother Malcolm. He said, there can be no black-white unity until there's first some black unity. There can be no workers' solidarity until there's first some racial solidarity. We cannot think of uniting with others until we have first uniting among ourselves. We cannot think of being acceptable to others until we have first proven acceptable to ourselves. We can't unite bananas with scattered leaves. That's Brother Malcolm again on the question of unity. But there's not that much difference between what Dr. King said and what Brother Malcolm said about unity. That's where I think there could be some conversation. About economics, Dr. King said, black power is also a call for the pooling of black financial resources to achieve economic security. While the ultimate answer to the Negro's economic dilemma will be found in a massive federal program for all poor along the lines of A. Philip Randolph's freedom budget, a kind of Marshall Plan for the disadvantaged. There is something that the Negro himself can do to throw off the shackles of poverty. Although the Negro is still at the bottom of the economic ladder, his collective annual income is upwards of $30 billion. This gives him a considerable buying power that can make the difference between profit and loss in many businesses. Through the pooling of such resources and the development of habits of thrift and techniques of wise investment, the Negro will be doing his share to grapple with his problems of economic uh, deprivation. If black power means the development of this kind of strength within the Negro community, then it is a quest for basic, necessary, legitimate power. That's Dr. King, y'all. That's Dr. King. You know, Martin Luther, I have a dream. That's what you all, you all hear? That's all you hear about him? Now, Brother Malcolm on economics. The economic philosophy of black nationalism means that every church and every civic organization and every fraternal order is time now for our people to become conscious of the importance of controlling the economy of our communities. If we own the stores, if we 
operate the business and say, we try and establish some industry in our, in our communities, that, then we are developing to the position where we are creating employment for our own kind. Once you gain control of the economy of your own community, then you don't have to beg and pick it and beg some other, or some other people downtown for a job in his business. Again, you see those two positions? That's a negotiating space in there where they can sit down and talk and maybe work out a mutual thing about the area of economics. Education. Education. Dr. King on, on Brother Malcolm on education. Education is an important element in the, in the struggle for human rights. It is, the, it, it, it is the means to help our children and our people discover their identity and thereby increase their self-respect. Education is our passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to the people who, people who prepare for it today. We must unite our efforts and spread our own programs of self-improvement through education to every, every Afro-American community in America. We must establish all over the country schools of our own to train our children, become scientists and mathematicians. We intend to take the tools of education to help raise our people to an unprecedented level of excellence and self-respect through their own efforts. That's Brother Malcolm on education. Here's Dr. King on education. Education without, with education without social action is a one-sided value because it has no true power or potential. Social action without education is a weak expression of pure energy. These uninformed by educated thought can take false directions. When we go into, when we go into action and confront our adversaries, we must be as armed with knowledge as they are. Our policies should have the strength of deep analysis beneath them to be able to challenge the clever sophistries of our opponents. That's Dr. King, y'all. And when you watch some of them going on today, you wish they would listen to these two positions. Because we have a tendency now to think, people think that just getting out there and chanting and, and, and running around and chanting no just is, is doing something. What he said, Dr. King said that uh, deeds uninformed by educated thought can take false directions. When we, go into, when we go into action and confront our adversaries, we must be as armed with knowledge as they are. Mm -hmm. Now, how many times have you watched demonstrations going on there? Do you, do you think those people are armed with knowledge? <laughs> Not very many. But, and you, but those same people will probably tell you how much they love Dr. King. Because they're not paying attention to what the brother was saying. Okay. Leadership. Dr. King is rough on black leadership, boy. Negro leaders suffer from this, inter this interplay of solidarity and divisiveness. Being either exalted, excessive, be, being either, being either exalted excessively or grossly abused. But some of those leaders who suffer from lack of sustained support are not without weaknesses that give substance to criticism. The most serious is aloofness and absence of faith in their people. The white establishment is skilled in flattering and cultivating emerging leaders. Mm. It presses its own image on them. And finally, from, from, from imitation of manners, dress, and style of living, a deeper strain of, of corruption develops. This kind of Negro leader requires the white man's con re re acquires the white man's contempt for the ordinary Negro. He is often at, like, more at home with the middle class white than he is among his own people. And frequently his physical home is moved up and away from the ghetto. His language changes, his location changes, his, his income changes, and ultimately he changes from the representative of the Negro to the white man and to the white man's representative to the Negro. The tragedy is that too often he does not recognize what he has, what has happened to him. Now I know y'all ain't never heard this Dr. King talking about leadership. Have y'all ever heard this Dr. King? Yes. Yes. Some people have. Yes. Good. But I know majority of us have. Majority of us have. Brother Malcolm on leadership. Our our accent will be on youth. We need, we need new ideas, new methods, new approaches. We will call upon young students of political science throughout the, the nation to help us. We will encourage uh, these young students to launch their own independent study and give us their analysis and their suggestions. We are completely disgusted 
with the old adult established politicians. We want to see some new faces, more militant faces. That's Brother Malcolm talking about the development. He sees develop the necessity of developing uh, young leaders, new leadership. Okay. International affairs. The Organization of Afro this is Brother Malcolm, the Organization of Afro American Unity, in cooperation with the coalition of other Negro leaders, lead, leaders and organizations, has decided to elevate our freedom struggle above the domestic level of civil rights. We intend to internationalize it by placing it at the level of human rights. Our freedom struggle for human rights is no longer confined to the domestic jurisdiction of the United States government. We beseech the independent African states to help us bring our problem before the United Nations and the grounds that the United States government is morally incapable of protecting the lives and property of the 22 million African Americans. And on, the, and on that grounds, that our determination, that our deter, deteriorating plight is definitely becoming a threat to world peace. One of the things that Brother Malcolm was doing during the last year of his life, was, and he spent a, much of that last year doing this, his, his goal was to have the United States government taken before the UN Commission of Human Rights yeah, right. for being either unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of black people. Yeah. According to Dr. John Henry Clark told me a couple of years after the assassination that he had gotten six African countries who had agreed to do this. And there were others leaning that way. Because he couldn't do it himself. He had to have a, a, a member of the UN do it. And, 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 and if you can imagine, can you imagine what J. Edgar Hoover and his boys felt about that? <clears throat> and I have with me a, the African states as a result of the groundwork laid by Brother Malcolm, when he attended the OAU conference in uh, 1964 in Cairo, they issued a resolution condemning discrimination in the United States. This was unheard of. I mean, the resolution is not the world's most militant resolution, but anything done at that time, we're talking about the height of the so-called Cold War, when the United States was involved in a tremendous propaganda battle with the Soviet Union, Russia, this would have been devastating. And by the way, folks, neither then, and as far as I know now, the United States has not yet signed the UN Charter on Human Rights. You know why they haven't signed it? Because of our presence here. And they know they're reckoned with us, and they know that, that countries can legitimately, whenever they use that state, can legitimately use that against them in a propaganda bank, which is what the Russians were doing during that period between 1955 and 1965 when Brother Malcolm was around. So he was involved in that campaign. Uh, now we know that the U.S. could have told the U.S. to you know, go take a long walk on a short period. But the propaganda thing would have been devastating. And I would leave, and I'm, I'm preparing now, the beginning of this coming June 1st, I'm going to start writing a new book. And the, and the whole function is going to be what Brother Malcolm was doing internationally. What his, his, what his international agenda was, because that has played a major role in, in the hatred felt toward him by J. Edgar Hoover and, and the United States federal government. Now, Dr. King internationally. I recently read through for the very first time, and it's a shame to have to admit this, uh, for the first time about six weeks ago, I read Dr. King's entire speech that he gave when he got the Nobel Peace Prize. I had read bits and pieces, but I've never read the entire speech. And I came across this section. Over the world like a fever, I'm sorry, all over the world like a fever, the freedom movement is spreading in, in the wildest, in, the, the, freedom, the freedom movement is spreading uh, in, the, in the widest liberation in history. The great masses of people everywhere are determined to end the exploitation of their races and lands. They are awake, they are moving, and the Negro of America has, has been caught up in the zeitgeist, that's a German word. With the, with, the black, with, the black, with the black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America, and the Caribbean, we too, we too, he too, is on the move. Again, Dr. King here is, what is he talking about here, folks? Connecting the civil rights movement right. 
internationalizing the civil rights movement. Can you imagine what J. Edgar Hoover thought when he heard, heard that speech? And you see, this, see, Brother Malcolm is already talking about internationalizing the human, because you know the OAAU, we always called ourselves a human rights organization. We never called ourselves a civil rights organization. And we, because we knew that human rights is the international term. But Dr. King, with this presentation, is talking about internationalizing the civil rights movement. And I would believe that when, when, when who of your boys read this, they said, that's it. That's it. We would keep an eye on these, on this, and, and we got to keep a close eye on them. Something is going on here. Something is going on. Both of these men, whom he, whom he feared, whom he said, we, would have, we wouldn't have any problem if we get those two guys fighting, if we could get them to kill one another off. Obviously, he foresaw the possibility that these two brothers one day might be working together. Or were, or were, or were moving in a, in a way that they might get involved and, be, and have a, a working relationship with each other. And this he feared. He feared this. And when I, when I read that UN speech, I said to myself, man, Dr. King, I did not know myself till I read that speech six, that Dr. King had said that, with the statement I just read you. I just kind of read the beginning of it. I never paid that much attention to it. But you see how much Dr. King's position was moving or was closing in to the position that Brother Malcolm held? That, 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 that the movement that was going on in this country must be, well, become part of the international movement that was going on against white supremacy and, uh, and Western exploitation. This is why I say that, that we really need to explore, and, I, and I'm, like I said, I'm just beginning this, the shared concepts of Brother Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King. Now I happen to believe, and I guess it's because, you know, uh, I'm basically a Malcolmite. I happen to believe that Dr. King was moving more towards <laughs> Brother Malcolm's position. <laughs> That brother Malcolm was moving toward Dr. King. Was in now. I'll leave that up to y'all. You know, we can have a vote on that. You know, uh, whatever. But, but uh, the Dr. King that you hear in these quotes that I just gave you is not the Dr. King that we hear about today. Not the Dr. King that you you know that you hear them talking about on Jan on his birthday. Dr. King, this is not this is not the Dr. King. I personally would not go to anything around Dr. King with the word dream in it. Any program, no panel, no nothing. If it's got the word dream in it, I, ain't, I won't be there. You know, because I think it has been a deliberate, a deliberate, a deliberate effort to, to, to basically, to me, as far as I'm concerned, to demean what he was and what he was doing when he was assassinated. There's a reason that Diego Hua, when he talked about we must present the rise of a black messiah, said that Brother Malcolm might have been that had he, had it was, if he was still around. But when he talked about possible successors, he said Dr. King was a possible successor. Now how many people even thought about the possibility of Dr. King heading what he called black nationalist type movements? But that's what Hoover thought. And because Hooper thought that, I'm convinced that he played a, that he helped play a role in the event of the assassination of Dr. King. That's why I say that these two brothers, I truly believe that had they not been assassinated, would have eventually worked together. And as I said before, I'm not trying to say they would have been you know, homeboys, but they were both committed. I re I've written a play called Malcolm, Mark, Medgar, in which the three of them are like in the hereafter, and they're looking down and commenting on things that have happened since their assassinations. And I have them talk about that. You know, 
about the possibility they that they may have had, uh, you know, with working together and things. And they, they had a little bit because they had a little bit. So they still had those disagreements. I think, but Dr. King still had his position on, you know, on uh, nonviolence. I, I prefer to call it passive resistance uh, rather than nonviolence. Brother Malcolm, they always say, well, they always say like, if Dr. King believed in that, then Brother Malcolm believed in that. No, he didn't. Brother Malcolm believed in self-defense. Right. Self-defense. Right. Self-defense. I tell people all the time when I go to these white universities, you find anywhere where Brother Malcolm said that black people should go out and start killing white people, and bring that back to me and I'll give you a hundred dollars. I've been doing it for 30 years and haven't had to pay nobody yet. <laughs> because it does not exist. Exactly. He was self-defense. He advocated self-defense. And, 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 and we need to remember that when we, because, uh, when, when we are talking about these two men, it's not a case of violence versus non-violence. It was self-defense or a nonviolent approach. That's what it was. But the, the thing to remember, folks, uh, brothers and sisters, is this. These two men had a total commitment to us. Because both of them could have at any time say, hey, man, I've done my shit. I'm out of here. I got children. We forget. They left behind two of them. Four and and six, ten children, babies. Basically, they were babies. They could easily have had an excuse to say, you know, I've done a lot. I've made my contributions. Now I'm going to look out for my family. Dr. King probably could have been president of Morehouse or the pastor of some big church down there in Atlanta. Brother Malcolm had job offers to teach on the continent. They could easily have said, and, and, we, and we'd not, we would not have been in a big position to criticize them because they had, they had put their lives on the line for a long period of time. They knew of who was hatred. They know what the FBI can do when they really want to, they know what, they can, what they're capable of doing. But they both stayed in the struggle to the point. Thirty-nine. They were both thirty-nine when they were assassinated. Right, exactly. They were both thirty-nine years old. They left behind ten children. And I always tell people, to me, those children are casualties because they paid. Sometimes I think we have a tendency to think that, oh man, Dr. King's children, Dr. Mentor's children. No, those children paid a price for their father's commitment to us. They paid a price, and what? Of course, the biggest price was not having their fathers. And then all those other things that that went on because of who they of who they were. And that's why today, when I when I hear people criticize them. I just say, hey, think about it. You know, think about it. What would you be like if you were 10, 6, 5, 4 years old and your father was assassinated? Well, the Malcolm's children were in the Audubon ballroom that, that Sunday. One daughter, the, the, the six year old daughter, of course, she remembers. The four and a half year old daughter remembers. The others don't really have no real memory of it. But they remember. Medgar Evers' children, I remember I, uh, Mrs. Evers, I heard her speaking in uh, 2013 around the 50th anniversary of the assassination of her husband. And I had read about her, you know, saying that she had to go out on the steps and wipe her husband's blood yeah. off the driveway and the steps so her children wouldn't see it. They had been taught to hit the ground when they heard shots. So when he was shot, they heard the shot. So the children did as they were been trained to do. They hit the floor and crawled to the bathroom. And when I, in 63, I heard Mrs. Evers tell that story in person. 
And, and, it, and although I had read it, the impact of seeing her, it brought tears to my eyes. As I tried to visualize her out there, you know, scrubbing those steps. I mean, do we, do we really, have we done enough of a job of letting our children know what the sec, I mean, have we really made our children aware of the terrorism that was going on in this country between 1955 and 1968? Have we really given them, you know, a real look at that? I mean, the bombings, the fire bombings, the, the, the beatings, the, 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 the uh, assassinations, the, have we really given them? I don't think we have. I don't think we have. We talk about Brother Malcolm and Dr. King, and, and, and we praise them, and, but we need to always put them into the context of that time, and especially, I call it that period between 1955 and 1968. That was the height of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, the movement during those, those years. And, and I don't think we have really, as far as I'm concerned, we have really given our young people, we don't put those into context as to what was going on, that these assassinations were just a part of a total terrorism. And that's the word used, too, when you're talking about it. Use the word terrorism. Because the kids now, they, they hear that word all the time. Well, show them that that was terror. If they want to, they talk about terrorism going today, then they should check that period out. It was terrorism going on. And I think that, that uh, more than anything else, I believe that J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, they were aware of the possibilities Brother Malcolm and Dr. King. They, are, they were aware of them as individuals, but what really rocked Hoover's nerves was any possibility of these two brothers working together. And as you can see from some of the quotes that I made, that there was room for them to sit down. And I, I heard from people who, I, I, I want to make it very clear, I don't ever claim to be a part of Brother Malcolm's inner circle, because I was not. But a couple people I know who were in the inner circle, and a couple people I know who were in Dr. King's inner circle, said there were quiet meetings going on to bring these two brothers together and have a meeting where they could sit down. It's unfortunate, of course. And of course, again, as I said before, Jacob Hoover did not want that to happen. And he made sure, the FBI made sure that it didn't happen. But, and I think that we have the responsibility. We, those of us who, who are supporters of either one of those two brothers, have the responsibility of, of showing this, of, of trying to show that you can, be, you can be a Dr. King supporter and still respect and admire Brother Malcolm. You can be a Brother Malcolm supporter and admire and respect Dr. King and work together. Because just to some of the suggestions they made about education, about economics, if we follow what they were both suggesting, we'd be in much better position today as people than we are right now. So I'm hoping that I've given you some, some room, some, some things to think about today, about uh, those two men and, 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 and the possibilities that might uh, occur if we would uh, follow some of the things they were teaching us and saying to us in education, economics, international affairs, uh, politics, unity. If we could just follow what they were doing. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for coming. Thanks for your sacrifice. Uh, Michael Luck Hotel, host of the African History Network show on that 10 a.m. Superstation. Uh, you talked about uh, Malcolm sending a letter to Dr. King asking for a meeting. Mm -hmm. That was uh, July 31st, 1963, when Malcolm was yes. still a nation of Islam. Yes. There's an article from the Washington Post that talks about the day that Dr. King met Malcolm 
and they talk about that there, and, and Dr. King refused to go to the meeting. Um, can you talk about, did Malcolm ever talk about that and, and why Dr. King did not refuse to go to the meeting? And then um, also, uh, you mentioned um, uh, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. Mm -hmm. It's originally called a cancel check. That's the yeah. original name of the speech. Yeah. Dr. King was talking about economics as well. Yeah. But talk about the uh, letter that, because uh, Malcolm was calling for actually a unification of all the civil rights leaders yeah. to come together to find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. Right. Thank you. As he, well, as he said in that speech, the letter was a letter that went to the, I think there were eight major, uh, yeah. Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, with the Young of the Urban League, right. Dr. King, A. Philip Randolph, Dorothy Hyde, James Farmer from CORE. Was John Lewis one of them also? I don't know, uh, okay. John Lewis, I think he might have been there for SNCC. Yeah. I'm not sure about John Lewis. Okay. But it went to, you know, uh, and and the, the full letter, by the way, I have the complete letter in, in, uh, in, in my memoir, I talk about that letter. Right. But he also said to them, you know, I guarantee that if you come to, to, to speak mm -hmm. uh, at this rally, uh, you'll be treated with respect. Right. right. That's what he says in the letter. You'll be treated with respect. I guarantee that. Right. But not one of them showed up. And we, I mean, exactly. they didn't show up because, you know, and, 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 the, and the key thing about this, because most people try to want to believe that Brother Malcolm tried to just kind of reach out and you think only after he left the nation of Israel. Right. He wrote this letter while he was still a member exactly. of the nation. Exactly. In fact, there are elements in the nation. Another one thing that some of the elements in the nation opposed him was because of this outreach. Right. They didn't want that kind of outreach. Right. They wanted to keep that little, you know, little, little, little group they had. They didn't want, they, they opposed his making that kind of outreach. Right. And so, uh, and, and I think that to me, the, 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 the content of the letter, which I read part of it, was important, but I think the important thing is that he sent that letter while he was still in the nation of Islam. Exactly. So this whole idea, he was, he was out, he understood then the importance of trying to establish some kind of uh, a unified effort. And that was the month before the March on Washington yes. also. Yes. So I, I think a lot of people think that's why the civil rights leaders did not show up to the meeting, because that's the month before oh, the yeah. March on Washington. And then because they're funding sources? Yeah, right. And we know, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. OK, thank you, brother. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for coming to Detroit. We really appreciate this. I, I think I'm going to go on again and say Detroit gets it now for that city. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know he gave one of his last speeches here. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted, in the uh, interest of giving some history, uh, which I think we really need to do, and I'm going to make it brief. Uh, there was uh, a man in Detroit called Philip Lenu, who was a close friend of Dr. King's. Mm -hmm and he was his roommate, and also one who bailed him out with money a lot of times. And he was the one who started the first black-owned brokerage company here in the state of Michigan. And I had the privilege of being his uh, mentor and friend of his. And I say that because Dr. King had been so close to him, and he was a real money man. Dr. King learned a lot probably about economics through uh, Philip Lenny. And that was really one of the main reasons why Dr. King was assassinated because he talked so much about economics. He did that through um, the Chicago thing when he talked about housing, uh, when he went to Memphis with the garbage people, and the most successful bus boycott. All that was around the whole idea of economics. And he had also gotten that idea from Dr. Jemison, who had been uh, head of the Baptist Association because they had had the first successful bus boycott in the nation. So I just wanted to bring that out as him having a, a grounding in what this system was about, which was based on capitalism. Yeah, I, in, in, in fact, again, it is, we have to accept some of the blame. We, we have, we've kind of participated, too many of us at least, in this whole idea, this is like the Montgomery Bus Cup was won because of some kind of moral, you know, appeal. No, the Montgomery Bus Cup was won. I was in Tuskegee at the time, I was a teenager. And Montgomery was about, about uh, 29 or 30 miles from Tuskegee. But there were people in Tuskegee who were going down to Montgomery and driving people around so they wouldn't have to ride those buses. 
That Montgomery bus driver was going because those bus drivers were losing thousands of dollars because of the, of the boycott. And they put the pressure on the politicians to do something about it. So we, we got to really, but you know, get away from this, this whole idea that this is some kind of, you know, America had changed. I read something recently that I wrote a column about that was a, a, a black Republican strategist in a local black newspaper in D.C. Uh, he was talking about Dr. King and, you know, trying to claim Dr. King. And he said people, uh, liberals often ask me, when was America great? And, he's, and then he says, America was great when Lincoln freed the slaves. America was great when we passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. America was great when we passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. America was great when we passed the, the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And America was great when we elected the first black, black president in, 19, in 2008. So I wrote a column and I say that all that stuff happened by, because of America was forced to do something. Because of the international situation. If it, had not, if, if, it, if it had not been for the fact that the, this country was involved in a huge propaganda war, they would allow the state governments to crush the civil rights movement. Yeah. They, said they allowed the lynching to go on uh, for years and never did anything about it, could never get a federal anti-lynching law passed. Uh, Lerone Bennett, the great general, he wrote a book called, by Lincoln, called Forced Into Glory. Right. This country was forced into passing that legislation. It was not passed because they changed, right. uh, because they had become all of a sudden, oh, you know, we've been doing, we've been doing wrong by our black folks, so now we're gonna change. <laughs> no, they changed because one day Eisenhower protected those students in Little Rock, because one day, uh, when there were, there were students in, in 57 in Little Rock were being spat upon and, and beaten and taught and done things to them. Uh, they, uh, somebody, one of his aides walked in and showed him the front page of the Russian newspaper. And they had all pictures of Little Rock. And next day, uh, Eisenhower nationalized the Arkansas National Guard. Before that, he would say he couldn't do nothing about it. So they were moved strictly by foreign policy concerns. Not a single one of those things was ever passed out of any sense of morality uh, 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 a change of heart on the part of the federal government. Yes. Um, thanks a lot, brother. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Mm -hmm. I have uh, it's probably a two-part question, but it has to do with this concept of division between Malcolm and Martin. Uh -huh. I'm asking a question that the premise, I, I, I didn't go through the civil rights movement, so I don't know what happened at that time where people said I'm a Malcolmite or I'm a, Mar a, I'm a King person. Mm -hmm. What caused that type of division to even, assuming that it is there, what caused that division to occur? And in my reading of this thing, I'm for the black community. And the fact that I can read about what Malcolm's done, what Martin's done, what Marcus has done, what Booker, everybody's done, helps to go to, uh, to um, achieve the mission of, our, of us as a community. Therefore, there's no division, there's just different thoughts that kind of like built and blended together to form some uh, approach to our success and our freedom. So speak to us a little bit more about what that division was like back then and, and why and why is it conceptually right now that it's taken as, yes, there was a, there's, you're either a king person or you're a mountain person. Well, I think it was because, as I said before, at that time I was like in my, in my, uh, in my, uh, you know, mid 20, I was 24 when I heard Brother Malcolm speak. 27 when he was assassinated. So a lot of us at that age, uh, we had that feeling, you know, I'm with Brother Malcolm. And so I really gotta be opposed to the Dr. King people because most of us, because we opposed the whole uh, nonviolent approach. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and sometimes that's easy for us to do because we're in New York and Washington. We're not in Alabama and Mississippi. Right. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, as you get older, you begin to think about that, man. I, I think about the fight between, I, I used to be very, in, in when I was, a, uh, of course, very critical of Booker T. Washington. Oh, he was a Tom, he was this, he was that. So Harold Cruz, I, talk, I had a chance yeah. to meet the great Harold Cruz. Mm -hmm. And Harold Cruz got us down there and read us the riot act mm -hmm. for talking about Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. And he said, William Monroe Trotter, he could talk about all he wanted to because he's up there in Boston. Yeah, right. You know, Booker T. Washington down there in Alabama. Right. You know, so we, we, we did not kind of understand that then. And that's why I say that we, you know, we kind of felt as though you were a king person or, or a Malcolm X person. 
Uh, obviously, Brother Malcolm had begun to overcome that already, as I said before, because he started making those, you know, and he participated in other things, joint things. When, when Kwame Nkrumah came to the country after Ghana's independence, they did a thing, and he, he worked with everybody to, you know, to help pull that off, you know. So it, it was, and it was, and then of course we also pay attention to the to the American press, exactly. you know, because they wanted us to be divided. Exactly. They wanted us to think that, they, that there were these two huge divisions between these two concepts, uh, between you know, and and we kind of, uh, you know, were influenced by that, uh, unfortunately. And I think to, that's why I say we have no excuse today. And if the, if the Malcolm X so supporters who say strong supporters of Brother Malcolm, people. So there's strong supporters of Dr. King. If we don't get together today and start working on the program these two brothers were advocating, then we, we can't blame nobody else. That's true. We can't blame white people, the government, nobody but ourselves. That's true. That's true. Yes. Uh, Brother Bailey, I, I want you to speak to uh, the following. I'll never forget the time when you wrote in Ebony Magazine an article about Brother Malcolm. And you started out the sentence, I'll never even forget the first sentence. Most people think of Malcolm as only an activist, when actually he's a master teacher. And then you went on to lay out points of why he was a master teacher. And would you address that, please? Okay, are you sure that was in Ebony? Uh, I don't think that uh, was in Ebony. Okay. At the time, you said you were a sports writer in yeah. North Carolina. Yeah, no, I, I, I never, I never wrote an article about the Malcolm with Ebony. I wrote, a, okay. I wrote a. The first time I talked about that was in a, in a column that I wrote for a black newspaper. No, I read it. Well, I, I thought I read it in Ebony. In Ebony, <laughs> maybe they published. Maybe Ebony published. Yeah, right. okay. I, I was on the staff of Ebony. For, I was on the staff of Ebony for years. You know, okay. uh, after. Because I tore out the article. I think it was from Evan. Well, it was okay. published in Evan. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'd have to check it out. But, anyway, but, but, but I do. But the that article concept. was so super bad, it could have yeah. been in, in the, on the, anyway. <laughs> when, I, when I began to speak about him uh, on college campuses, I was trying to think of a way to, you know, to talk about him in a way you know, that students could understand. Was, so I came with the concept of master teacher. And I got it because uh, when I was, uh, after I left Ebony, uh, I became uh, the associate director and, and, and editor of the news of the publication for the Black Theater Alliance, which was an organization of black theater and dance companies based in New York. And, and I used to notice with the dance companies especially, now these are dancers who I thought were like super Judith Jamison, you know, they were super dancers that in my estimation, but if Catherine Dunham came to town, or, uh, uh, you know, a, a dancer on that Pearl Primus, uh, dancers on that level, they went to their classes because they considered them as masters. And, 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 and so they would go, despite the fact that I thought Judith Jamison was, was one of the great dancers I'd ever seen, she went to study. And, so I, I said, you know, that's a, con that's a great concept. And so I developed that concept. That's how I came with the thing of Master Teacher Brother Mel. Because I think that more than anything else, he was, for, for, for me and for those of us who were around him, he was a teacher, man. I mean, he taught us. He taught us, man. I mean, it was like, I told everybody, you know, I was getting, I got a, a BA, an MA, and a PhD in those 15 months that I was closely involved with him. In terms of history and, you know, and, and, and international affairs and just being able to learn. I mean, just little things. I remember the very first newsletter. The very first newsletter that I wrote, I wrote an article. My first journalistic article was about the killing of a 15-year-old uh, James Powell that led to the Harlem Uprising right. in 1964. Right. That was my first article I ever wrote. And Brother Malcolm was in Cairo at the time, uh, attending the uh, OAU conference. And uh, so he would call back to the New York office, and, and we would give him an update. And so when it was my turn to speak to him, I said, eyewitnesses to the murder, and he stopped me. He said, no, Brother Peter, you can't use the word murder, because the murder and murderer are legal terms. You can only use it when he's been, when the cop has been convicted, and we know he's going to be acquitted. And if you call, if you use murder or murderer, and when he's acquitted, he can sue. Oh. He said, call him a killer. 
and refer to it as a killing, because he's a killer, and it's a killing, no matter what the circumstances. Mm -hmm. And and his brother and I, we, we, we had those old-fashioned mimeograph machines. You know, he had to turn the handle to make copies, and we had, and we had already run off about six hundred copies. Of <laughs> so rather than we, rather than try to redo them, we scratched out the word murder and wrote killing above it. And, and I still have copies of that to this day. But, uh, and sure enough, Gilligan, when he was acquitted, he sued uh, Core and Martin Luther King's organization, putting out stuff calling him a murderer. It was little things like that he taught us. He also taught us, and, and he said, if we having a rally, and somebody come into the rally, and we having a rally or a meeting, and somebody stands up and says, we ought to go bomb the subways. He said, stop the meeting and put that person out. Because right. nine times out of 10, that person is a plant. Right. Right. And if you, if you discuss that for even 30 seconds, right. everybody can be picked up for conspiracy. Yeah. And though they may have a weak case, they can keep the tied up in the course for two or three years. He said, don't. And, and so we, we, we never did. I, I thought about that when I saw those demonstrations around the killing of Michael Garner in New York. And, and everybody was, you know, was chatting and Here. had their signs up. And all of a sudden, you heard somebody say, what do we want? Dead cops. When do we want it? Now. And I was watching on television. I said, I'll bet you the amount of money I got. Yeah. Whoever said that is working with the cops. Mm. Working with the cops. Because see, instead of you seeing the demonstration on the 6 o'clock news, all you see are those people chatting, what do we want? Dead cops. When do we want it now? So you know, he taught us to be careful about that kind of thing. Man. He even told us when the Harlem thing occurred in 1964, he told us, keep our people out of it. He said sometimes the police deliberately provoke certain things in order to smoke certain people out so they can make mass arrests. Well, the Malcolm was, you know, you know he, like he said, you had to think. He didn't believe in just jumping and, you know, and spontaneous. And, no, everything had to be thought. You know, use your brains. Don't fall into the traps that this society sets. With a whole bunch of words. You know, he, was, he, he really taught us that, man. And that's why I call, to me, there's no more important member of the community, more valuable member of the community than a master teacher. And he was a master teacher. Any more questions? Hoover was also famous for always making speeches about no such thing as organized crime. Yeah. Now, from what I understand, that he was talking about the mafia, and the reason he never did go after the mafia, because they had compromising photographs of him dressed up as a woman, <laughs> and that kept him from investigating the FBI. I mean, the mafia. Yeah. But could you talk about the four-year investigation on Marcus Garvey when he was a younger Hoover? You know, in 1919. Yeah, Hoover, Hoover had a, you know, you hear rumors that Hoover, who basically, I have heard that Hoover had black in his background. Now, I don't know how true it is. I've never seen anybody who's written it in such a way that you could say, yeah, that's the absolute truth. But I have read, heard this and read it on a couple of things. And, and so you find people like the people who are passing they become more anti-black than anybody else. Because they're trying to, you know, fit in with the, with the, and Hoover was very anti-black. I mean, it was almost, it was, yeah, I mean, you're right. It was almost, someone said pathological. Which makes me believe there might have been something in that. Now, I've heard the stories, too, about, you know, about the mafia having some, some compromising photographs of him. I don't know. All I know is that, that he, he had a friend named Clyde Tolson, and they had lunch and dinner together every day for 44 years. <laughs> and, and, uh, that's all I know. <laughs> every day for 44 years. But I do know that he did not mess too much with the mafia. Because I want to say they did. They, that's what I heard. I, I would never go around and say that because I don't, you know, I've never, I don't know. But I just know that he was very, you know, he was anti black. And, and he had, 
and 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 he really and truly uh, hated. Uh, I think his hatred of Brother Malcolm and Dr. King was even worse than his hatred of of, 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 of Marcus Garvey. But he regarded anybody that you know. That's why you know some of the day, this whole thing now going on between Trump and everything. I'm, I'm you know what I wrote a column on it. I said you know. To me, it's like a cat right now. I hope they both scratch each other's eyes out. You said between Trump and who? In the FBI. Oh, FBI. You know, and I said I hope they. It's like it, it's like a cat fight, and and if I was a black, those black politicians stay out of it. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they should stay out of it, and let them. As, as I said, it's a cat fight. Let's let's hope that that, that Trump and Trump and the FBI scratch each other's eyes out. That's that's my position. <laughs> Cause we have no, we have nothing to lose, nothing to gain or lose, nothing left in that battle. And and, and we should also say out of any talk of impeaching Trump. Maxine Waters needs to shut up. You know, you have to look, see. You have to learn how. You have to learn how to. Have the time. That's when some, when there's a family fight going on. You. you you, the worst thing you get involved is to get in the middle of a family fight. Because they will make up. They will make up. You get in the middle of a family fight. Let them fight that out. We sit back and take notes, and we can pass on information to either one of the groups that would break the other, we pass it on to them. We got some hot stuff on somebody that we can give the, one of the fighters to use against the other one, and we pass that on to them, but we stay out of it. We, and we do that, we do it very quietly. We don't do it on television and you know, write no articles about it. We just say, hey man, I just got some hot news that I can give you that help you in your fight against your friend over here. And here it is. And you do it very quietly, don't say nothing about it. You know? That's what Brother Malcolm understood that kind of stuff, man. He told us, be very careful sometimes, man, because sometimes they would instigate certain things in order to smoke certain people out so they can make mass arrests. That's what those of us who were involved with him, we never got in trouble for what we, you know, making statement like I always made that thing with that eyewitnesses to the, you know, to the murder. That cop, I mean, can, I would have been sued. You know, I don't know what he would have got because I didn't have a penny. <laughs> but he might have sued me, and, you know, and, and it keep you tied up in the courts, which was the idea. But the, 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 there were so many little things like that. That he, that he taught us. Yes? Brother Malcolm wrote a column that used to be published in, in, the, in the, some of the black newspapers. I, I believe that he wrote most of the columns used to have Mr. Muhammad's name on it. He wrote those. Because <laughs> he was the one who, he was the writer. He was a journalist. And, and that's why I always feel, you know, is that he's the reason that I became a journalist. Because when, as I said before, when, when, they were, uh, when we were div dividing up various responsibilities after those meetings, the OAAU formation meetings, nobody volunteered to do the newsletter. So I said, I'll do it, although I had never had not a single you know, bit of writing. Although I, I must, and when I was in, the courses in high school in my two years of college at Howard, that required writing and that kind of thing were the courses that I did best in. I did, I mean, I was, I was, I was a wreck. And I had a, one of those scholarships at Howard where I had to keep a B average. <laughs> Boy, dealing with math. I had a hard time. I got, I got, I had no problem with those other courses, but when it comes to anything dealing with math, man, I was like out of it. And, uh, and I had to really, you know, so, but 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 he was he was a uh, uh, he had a journalistic type of attitude. He 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 believed in doing research. Mr. Michaud, uh, uh, who owned the bookstore in Harlem, yeah, uh, which called itself the the home of common sense and proper propaganda. That was the theme of the bookstore. And he said that Brother Malcolm would come in that store sometimes and uh, and get back in those books. And Mr. Michelle would just find the clothes, you know, was closing time. He would just close one and leave him in there. <laughs> and he'd be there back in those book stacks all night. You know, I mean, he was a, he was a, there's a, there's a, there's a quote, and I hate to use it because it's written by an enslaving president named James Madison. 
But the quote is so appropriate. And, and I think Brother Malcolm, to me, un, understood what, what this, this uh, no good enslaver meant by it than anyone else that I ever met. On the front of the, his, of the Madison Building in Washington, the Library of Congress, it says, knowledge will forever govern ignorance. And a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. Now to me, I said cringe, but I use that quote, talking to young people. Because that's, that, 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 that's, that's, he's, he said it. And I tell students, say, you know, he just say sometimes, knowledge will sometimes govern ignorance, or often govern ignorance, or usually govern ignorance. He said, knowledge will forever govern ignorance. And I think that's, you know, I have a tendency, uh, you know, I, I'm one of these people who, you know, when I come across good quotes, I, I don't care where, I, I found a quote on the side of the fence that said, when you lose, don't lose the lesson. I stopped right there and took a pound of pen and wrote it down. <laughs> you know, and I use it. I came across a Mandela quote. A good head and a good heart are a formidable combination. You know, so you have to be, you know, there are three kinds of people in the world. Those, let's see, I don't know, I've almost forgot it now. Those who, uh, make things happen, yeah. things happen, and wonder what happens. Yeah, those who, those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what's happening. I think, unfortunately, today, too many of our people are in that I'm third category, <laughs> wondering what's happening. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to hear. Oh. I guess you put your glasses on. No, my glasses are for reading. <laughs> okay. Much love and gratitude. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> being much love and gratitude for your dedication and sacrifice, and uh, we love and honor you, Papa. Um. Um. So what I wanted to ask was, um, can you speak on uh, the meeting that never took place, but had the potential between Che Guevara and Brother Malcolm X? And um, as it was planned prior to uh, Che Guevara's, um, um, his, uh, um, uh, what was it, like his, um, his expedition to Cuba, mm -hmm. and the potential um, that it had to actually propel um, the organization of Afro-American uh, unity as well, and how all of this took place between the short span of like 1964 and 1965, just to put it in perspective. Okay, uh, I, I really be very you. I don't know very much about uh, his any connection here with Che Guevara. I really don't. Uh, okay. But I, I I do remember I was I was I was there in 1962 when Castro came to Harlem. And uh, and Brother Malcolm was one of the people who went into the Hotel Teresa on the two yes. to meet with Castro. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and I can remember that those of you, those like myself, we would we would come home from work every day and we would go down and stand there on the Twenty Fifth Street and uh, at Seventh Avenue <coughs> and be yelling, you know, Fidel, Fidel. And finally, Castro would come out and wave to us, and then we would go home. <laughs> we did that. We did that every day while he was while he was there. And, uh, you know, in uh, you know, in Harlem, uh, we we would do that every day. After, you know, we would, we would go there and scream out his name until he came out and waved to us. Then we would, we would go home. But uh, I really don't know. Uh, I know about that meeting, but I don't really know very much about the meeting with Che Guevara. Um. Yeah. But basically, um, they had the potential to meet uh, back in 1964, and so I just wanted to see your perspective as far as like you know, um, uh, like conspired moves from the government to make that meeting not happen. Right. And oh, yeah, well, I mean, that was just another one of those things that added to, you know, to who was the, this, this conflict with him. I'll tell you what, when, when, it, when I really personally got real <coughs> concerned, <coughs> not the concern, that's, that's too mild, started really feeling frightened about Brother Malcolm, it was in 1964 in December. 
when they had debates at the United Nations around the United States, England, and Belgium had invaded the Congo. And they claimed that they invaded the Congo <coughs> to save these white nuns from these terrible African, right. you know, savages. Right. And uh, two African UN diplomats, one from Ghana and one from Guinea, Kwame Nture and Sekou Toure. Kwame Nkrumah and Sekou Toure from, from Guinea. No, it wasn't them, but it was their, their UN diplomats. When they spoke at the UN, they made a comparison that I am sure uh, caused Hoover to go berserk. Both of them said, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, said in essence that if the United States has the right to invade the Congo to save those nuns, who's to say that we don't have the right to help those black people who are being killed in Mississippi? And I can remember when I read that in the New York Herald Tribune newspaper. Of course, I was very glad they did it, but I said to myself, oh my God, they're going to be after him about that. You know what I mean? I started. That's when I really got to say, oh man, because I knew that I knew that that the Hoover and the boys they were berserk. You know, you they, they, in fact, the papers say that the American ambassador to the UN, who was Abbey Stevenson, uh, at the time that he made that, said they were astounded that those Africans made that connection. That had never been done before. That was all because of the groundwork laid by Brother Malcolm. That was all because of the groundwork. That whole statement, he issued a long statement to the African leaders at the, uh, at the, uh, the UN. When he went to the OAU conference, I have that here somewhere. Oh yes. This right here is the, remember I told you that the African nations yeah. issued a resolution condemning discrimination in the state because of the ground. This is it. And I know our little newsletter, this, is, this was in our, the OAAU newsletter. I know we were the only ones, only publication in America at the time that published that, the complete statement. I'm going to leave a copy with the, with the museum. This is a copy of it. But uh, it was, and, and I can, again, this was unheard of. In 1964, the United States involved in a propaganda war with the Soviet Union, the height of the so-called Cold War. And they got the African leaders for the first time issuing a resolution. This is all because of the groundwork laid by Brother Malcolm. Which is why they considered him so dangerous. He was, he was serious about that. In fact, I have a funny, what is that quote? There was a, it was in Jet Magazine. You know, Brother Malcolm could be funny sometimes. <laughs> sometimes he would get up there, man. You know, you know see, I tell people, tell you, you know, Brother Malcolm's, Brother Malcolm's father, you know, was a Baptist preacher. And you know, they know how to do all kind of little things. And, he's, and sometimes Brother Malcolm would, would, would uh, I remember one time him saying, uh, you know, the Baptist preachers say sometimes say, Amen, flowers. If they say something and the audience is not responding, Brother Malcolm did that one time at a rally. <laughs> Only he didn't say he didn't say uh, flowers. He said chairs. <laughs> but uh, oh yes, here it is. Oh, it was in Jet Magazine, Words of the Week, uh, explaining. You see, talking about brother, explaining he does not believe uh, Malik Al Shabazz Malcolm X in explaining why he does not believe. The Congolese practiced cannibalism on white settlers. You know, it, during that time, anytime the Africans had a fight with any European people, the first thing they start talking about is cannibalism. Yep. Yep. They always brought up cannibalism. Yep. Now we talk, folks, this is 1960s. <laughs> but anytime, any conflict between African people and European people, they bring up cannibalism. So uh, Brother Malcolm says, uh, it says here, in explaining why he does not believe the Congolese practiced cannibalism, on white settlers, this is what Brother Malcolm said, quote, some of those settlers have been in the Congo 
more than 10, 40 years, if the Congolese, if the Congolese freedom fighters wanted to eat them, they would have done so many years ago when they were young and tender. <laughs> Word of the week, get back and you have to take a word of the week. And that was a, that was Brother Malcolm's response when he was asked about that. I, I was laughing when I read that. Man. That's crazy. He said that uh, they've been in that they've been in for 40 years, and they would they would eat them, they would ate them when they were young and tender. You know, so so you know he and, and that's sometimes people forget he had a real great sense of humor. He really did. Brother Malcolm had a great sense of humor. Right, much love and gratitude. Thank you, uh, these will, I'm sorry, this will be our last two questions. Uh, sir, it's a privilege and an honor for you to be here today in the presence of you. Just very quickly, there was a book written about Malcolm X, by, it's called A Life of Reinvention by Manny Marble, uh -huh. and you've been familiar with Malcolm X. What did you feel about that book that he wrote? Manny Marble almost made me into a believer again in the fact that he disappeared about three days. He was removed about three days before that, three or four days before that book was published. Because that book is a real, Matt Marable interviewed me for that book, and I, I first said no, I was not doing it any kind of way. But a young lady that I knew was one of his research assistants, and, and so she kept you know, calling me, and, oh, Professor Bill, please come, because you know, you, you have a, so finally I agreed to go be interviewed. So I went and had a lunch with him and his, and his people. He mentions me uh, five times in that book, and almost every one of them is, 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 is a distortion of what I said. And, 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 and to me, uh, that book is, a, is an attempt by Mad and Marable and the white academic establishment to demean and bring down, they don't like the fact that Brother Malcolm's being held in such high esteem by more and more people. So that book, to me, is an attempt to bring him down, try to, to, to diminish him. And, 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 and Marable, and, and the whole thing about you know, the, uh, the homosexuality thing. I said, you can bet every penny you got in the world, J. Edgar Hoover would have known that. <laughs> <laughs> and if he had not, he would have had somebody come up and, and, you know, and say it, just, to, just, just use it against him. So that's it. But the whole thing, man, is just a bunch of, a bunch of junk. And you have never seen a book of scholarship with so many perhaps and usuallys, you know, and, and, and often, mm. you know, all those, you know, holding backs, right. uh, not being, not, you know, covering himself yeah. instead of saying something straight out. Yeah. Scholarly books are not supposed to do that. Right. They're supposed to be able to quote somebody and say this, right. that, the other. Right. Marable has all these perhaps and just, you know, it was a, it was a bunch of junk. And, and fortunately, uh, I think part of the re part of this, the, uh, the selling thing for that book was that people such as myself that we were going to be jumping. So we decided we just not going to say that that book come and go because he wanted a lot of publicity. All those black militants, you know, attacking, and of course with him passing on, that would have made it even worse if we had been like really, you know, attacking, attacking him. But uh, the book is a is a is, is a. And of course, when I read the epilogue, and Marables talks about how much help he had been, because Marables was about not well about the last four or five years of his work out of that book. He was not well. And he said that he got a tremendous amount of assistance from a professor at, uh, at Columbia. I think his name was Richard Cohen. But when I read that line, I said, uh-huh. Don't have nothing else need to tell me about that book. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And now I didn't have to know nothing else after I read that line. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Bailey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your talking audience. But I wanted to ask you to share with us, take us to the last moments, being at the Autobahn Hall, um, you were one of, you said, the five last people who saw Malcolm X alive. So take us to that place, if you will, his disposition at the time, and then after you do that, if you will kind of share with us some of the reflections 
you've had on that fateful day. Thank you. Uh, I remember that, that day as being probably one of the saddest days of my life, only changed by the death of my, of my mom and dad. Uh, I, uh, that morning, February 21st, I had uh, saw an article in the New York Times about the, an organization called the Deacons for Defense and Justice, which I still think was the greatest name that came out of that time. The brothers called themselves the Deacons for Defense and Justice. And they were some church brothers who had decided they were going to start protecting people who were demonstrating. I think it was in Louisiana. And so I clipped the article out to take it to the rally that day. And uh, when Brother Malcolm came in, and this is, a, this is one reason why I, so, I find Manny Marable so despicable. When Brother Malcolm came in that day, I was already there. And so he said to me, Brother Peter, when you get a chance, come backstage, I want to talk to you. So I said, okay. Now Marable, in his book, despite my fact I have explained to him, just way I'm explaining to you, he says that when, when I think he says that Malcolm came in, he was encountered by A. Peter Bailey, and, 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 and he made it sound as though Brother Malcolm reprimanded me for something. And, uh, and, and as though that our last thing, my last encounter with Brother Malcolm was, uh, had some kind of hostility to it. I will forever despise Marigo for doing that because it was exactly the opposite. Okay. It showed, showed to me how, what, a, what a considerate and courteous and, and caring person Brother Malcolm was. He came in, so I went backstage and he, I had, the day before, February the 20th, I had written a news release to be, we were gonna distribute it the next day at the rally. I don't know what I said in it to this day, but whatever it was, when Brother Malcolm came by the office on February the 20th, I gave him a copy of it to read. And when he read it, he said, Brother Peter, this is nice, but I wish you wouldn't distribute it. So I said, okay. I put it off to the side. Again, like before, we had already run off about 500 of them. <laughs> you know, I put them off to the side. So he came in the next day, and you know, he asked me, so when I went backstage, and here's this brother under all this pressure. His, he had been banned from France uh, three weekends before. His home had been firebombed mm. the next weekend, and now we're the third weekend. And uh, so he's, you know, there's a lot of pressure. Because I said to people all the time, when his home was firebombed, I don't care how devoted you are, committed you are. He knew the danger he was in all the time, but this put his children in danger. When the home was firebombed, that's another whole ball game. That's another whole ball game. And uh, so when he came, uh, when I went backstage, uh, despite all of this, under all this pressure, he said to me, "Brother Peter, uh, I know you put a lot of work in the." the release that you wrote. I hope you understand why I asked you to not distribute it. And I said, oh yeah, I understood. Now here's this brother under all this pressure, and he's concerned about my feelings. Mm -hmm. And I always use this as an example when I talk to students, to show you the type of person, who he was as opposed to the type of person that they generally try to portray him. He's under all this pressure. And he's concerned whether or not my feelings were hurt because he had asked me to not distribute this, this news. I said, no, I understood. You know, I, I, I stood, I said, I put him off to the side, that's it. And then I showed him a copy of the, the uh, article on the Deacons for Defense and Justice. He read it and he said, man, this is great. This is self-defense. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And there were no other things he talked about. But I do remember him saying, the way I feel today, I should not even be here. <coughs> the way I feel today, that's what he said to us. Wow. And we said to him, why don't you leave, go home, people will understand, you know, that all the things have been happening to you. And he said, no, because they want to they hear from me about being banned from France and the firebomb. They want to hear directly from me, so I really have to, uh, to you know, to, to speak today. So, uh, and then he asked that not any one of us recognize there was a Baptist preacher from, who was supposed to come in that day to make an appeal for clothing for his children, because everything had been burned up right. when the home was firebombed. Yeah. And as he asked which one of us 
that was the ones backstage, recognized him. I said, well, I know what he looks like. So he told me to go out front and wait on him. Then when he comes in, to bring him backstage. And the other one, ball room, I don't know what you know, but that's a huge ball room. Almost like a football field ball or something. Huge ball room, wide and long. And uh, so I went, I went uh, out there to, uh, to uh, and I was sitting facing the entrance in the small lobby area. Uh, and I heard Brother Malcolm say, Assalamu alaikum. And next thing I heard was shots. And, and people were screaming and you heard shots. And, and I mean, to me, it sounded like a hundred shots. I, I, it wasn't that many, but it, that's the way it sounded. And um, so we fell down on the floor, those of us who were in that little lobby area. And when the shooting stopped, I ran down and jumped up on the stage. <coughs> and uh, one of our, very close to Yama was a Japanese American, very involved with us. She had him in her cradle in her arms, and I saw his, his shirt was open, I saw all these bullet holes in his body. And I remember thinking, he's gonna die, he's gonna die. And he was gasping. And then these brothers came in, they'd gotten a roll of stretcher. And they put him on and they rolled him over to the coat. Columbia Presbyterian Hospital was right across the street, and not a doctor from that hospital came to the order. It. it was right across the street. That's why I hate that hospital to this very day. Not a doctor came over. And, then, and the brothers had to, had to bull guard a stretcher. They had to just take a stretcher. And they brought it over and put him on it, and they rolled him, rolled him out. And uh, then uh, I jumped out off the stage, and, and was walking through the ball and people were laying all over the floors and screaming and crying and, and uh, chairs were all knocked over and everything. And I saw these two policemen and they were like, you would thought they were in a stroll in Central Park. And I was just getting ready to say something and my roommate grabbed me and said, keep your mouth shut and, and took me out. And then I went home and I, for the rest of the day, because this was in the, in the afternoon, <clears throat> for the rest of the day and all night I was like, and then I got the next day and I wrote, that I sat down and wrote my reaction to everything. And that's in my, in my uh, memoir. I put that in the memoir, the, uh, my reaction. That what I wrote that day is the first time it's ever been published anyway. And that, that was it, that was it. And by July, I, had, I said, I gotta get out of here. So I quit my job, I was working at the Time Inc. as, a, as a, what they call an editorial reference clerk. <coughs> And uh, they had profit sharing. So I got my profit sharing money and I, I, went, I, took, I went to North Africa Then I came back into, I was trying to get to Cairo, I don't know why. But I never got to Cairo because I missed it. I went over on a ship, a, not a ship, a freighter. Freighter was a, was a that was what? It was a, it was a freighter, it took freight. And they had 18 passengers and I was one of the 18. Yeah. And uh, I was the only black person on the trip. And, and I'll never forget there was this Jewish couple on the trip. And they just swore I was uh, on the way to cop. You know, they, they had heard about my being involved with Brother Malcolm. So they were very hostile towards me. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was on my way to Cairo to meet Nasser and all this kind of stuff they were saying. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I missed it. The, uh, the boat from Casablanca to Cairo. And I didn't feel like waiting around for us. So then I came into Paris. And I met the brother who, who, who was involved with the OAAU in Paris. They said, I met Carlos Moore, who's an Afro-Cuban. And Carlos told me about, Carlos was the one who told me about the banning, my brother about to be banned in France. And he was at the airport waiting on him, because they were having a rally in France and in Paris. And, he, and then I told him about the assassination. But Carlos, Carlos was, uh, the other members of the OAAU in Paris were no longer there, because they had run them all the people associated with the organization, the De Gaulle government had run them out of France. Carlos was only there because he was on the outs with, with the Cuban government, with Castro them. Because Carlos was saying that even under Castro, the black Cubans were not getting their rightful share of power. And the Cuban government had taken his passport. So he couldn't leave, that's why he was still there when I got there. And, uh, but uh, Carlos was the head of the, uh, the OAU in, uh, in, uh, in, in Paris, in France. But that's, that was that was my. I sat down and wrote how I felt. That was February, end of February, by July. I was just still so depressed. I said, "I'm out of here," and I I was gone for almost. I came back in September, I think. It's going from July to September.
Charles A. Trek Museum and the Detroit Institute of Arts would like to thank you, Mr. They was the kind of thing. See now, Brother Malcolm, he, he couldn't catch Brother Malcolm because like, Brother Malcolm was aware of that. Mm -hmm. See, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think Lord and them really recognized how treacherous yeah. these people were. But yeah. Malcolm did. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So they were gonna catch. He would not have a situation where he was alone with the woman he was like, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Jane on top of the truth, remember how they had spread all that stuff about Betty. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and remember that other part about when the reporter would yeah. say something, he said, no, that's what you said. Yeah. He yeah. tried to yeah. put words in his mouth. And that's why you got to be careful. He understood yeah. the press. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, see, that's there, there was subterranean subtlety in the intelligence community yeah. Yeah. where they had, you know, Dr. Yeah. Ben was here. And he talked about how they put the draw. Okay. He had to Garvey, ex boyfriend, under Garvey's bed. Mm. He called Garvey at a low moment. And yeah. He believed Amy Ashwood was missing yeah. around on him. He got rid of about 30, 40 days after they, big, they had the biggest hot boy in the house. Then all of a sudden they break it up. That's what they did. That's what they did. Dr. Beard said they put the draw. Oh, that's what he called Garvey. He called Garvey. Oh, okay. Look, you only bought 25 books. Well, I, well I, I can have some more shipped out. Oh, you want to have some more shipped out? Yeah, okay. What I know, okay. I met Ruben. Ruben died here in Detroit. Oh, okay. His name was John Davis. Your okay. name is Dan. I never knew Ruben's a real thing. I never knew. Like he's going under John Davis. Yeah. Now, this is, uh, he died. I had his old bitch with it. It was his sister because he came up to me in now Agnon from the history and I don't care what it was. And I sold tapes in that old 30 years. So my whole first role was mouse. And see, I was selling this stuff at a time where it was dangerous. Yeah. Okay, so I guess brother, brother just saw that I was in the mouth like that. And he approached me. He said, hey, brother, and he stood up to me one day. And he was yeah. But I didn't know yeah. enough about the dynamics at that yeah, time yeah. to see how important he was. Yeah. Okay, he was but his very sister, very his daughter is here. His wife is still alive. His daughter is here and she's writing a book on him. Okay. And I, I found this out from his sister. And see, I went to South Carolina for two years. I'm just getting back. Yeah. And I ain't been able to run into that stuff yet. So I'm trying to find, I had a copy of the obituary. I regard Brother Ruben as a hero, man. I so swear, like, if, like, if, uh, if, if air had gotten away, so yes. that now, I got that AOAU meeting. What y'all talking about? Yeah. 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 Ye